In those days, Robert Oppenheimer, called by the popular press the father of the atomic bomb, was probably as famous as Einstein. Many newspaper and magazine articles were written about him. It was in one of those articles that I read his quote from the Bhagavad Gita. Perhaps I had read that this quote was from his own translation of the Gita from Sanskrit. Or maybe I had read his claim that access to the Vedas is the greatest privilege this century may claim over all previous centuries. Think about it, what a remarkable claim for an eminent physicist who contributed from the earliest days to the founding of quantum mechanics, which to this day is the most successful theory in the history of physics. And after he established his theoretical physics program at Berkeley, was viewed by other physicists as the father of American theoretical physics. In short, Oppenheimer was viewed as a great physicist both by the popular press and by his peers. Understandably, I was impressed both by Oppenheimer and his praise of Eastern religious philosophy. It was perhaps in this context that I read his claim that the general notions about human understanding, which are illustrated by discoveries in atomic physics, are not in the nature of things wholly unfamiliar, wholly unheard of or new. Even in our own culture they have a history, and in Buddhist and Hindu thought a more considerable and central place. What we shall find in modern physics is an exemplification and encouragement and a refinement of old wisdom. I knew that he certainly wasn't the only physicist who incorporated certain Eastern beliefs into his own worldview, beliefs that sometimes seemed to parallel Jung's notion of the collective unconscious. For example, perhaps I had read Einstein's famous quote, a human being is part of the whole, called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts, his feelings, as something separate from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. The striving to free oneself from this delusion is the one issue of true religion. Looks like Einstein also believed in something like an all-encompassing consciousness, a belief that probably he absorbed from his study of Buddhism and Hinduism. Or maybe I had read that during his last two years he kept two books by his nightstand, the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita, or perhaps I had read the quote often attributed to Einstein that when I read the Bhagavad Gita and reflect upon how God created this universe, everything else seems so superfluous. I've read that quote many times in print and on the web, and it does sound like Einstein in his last few years, but I haven't been able to personally verify its authenticity. However, I did find a first-person account of a man who lived in Einstein's home after Einstein rescued him and his family from Hitler who reported that Einstein's Sanskrit was not too good, because Sanskrit is only of interest to those who wish to study ancient texts from India, and because even a poor knowledge of Sanskrit is no minor achievement. One must conclude that Einstein must have been quite interested in Indian philosophy, or maybe much later when I was still trying to make sense of my experience on that Korean hillside. I had read a quote from another famous physicist, Niels Bohr, but I go to the Upanishads, ancient Indian Hindu philosophy, to ask questions. Before I was born, Niels Bohr became famous for making feasible a planetary model of the atom. The familiar image that most of us have of electrons whirling around the atom's nucleus. When honored by Denmark for his work in physics and permitted to create a coat of arms, he designed one around the Taoist yin yang symbol, his tribute to Eastern philosophy. And quite possibly, I had read one of the Eastern-oriented remarks of Erwin Schrodinger, the author of the wave formulation of quantum mechanics, such as, subject and object are only one. The barrier between them cannot be said to have been broken down as a result of recent experience in physical sciences, for this barrier does not exist. How's that? The barrier between the observer and the object that he or she is observing does not exist? What a remarkable thing to say, remarkable, at least to our Western ears. But it certainly is an account with Jung's notion of a collective unconscious, an accord that is even more explicitly stated in his claim that, inconceivable as it seems to ordinary reason, you and all other conscious beings as such are all in all. 
Hence this life of yours which you are living is not merely a piece of the entire existence, but is, in a certain sense, the whole. On another occasion he said, Multiplicity is only apparent. In truth, there is only one mind. Kodinga became a serious student of the ancient Vedanta from India. Vedanta is a summary of the core lessons from the ancient writings called the Vedas, which explain how to achieve final emancipation from this material realm and become one with God. The Vedanta's influence was especially prominent toward the end of Grodinger's influential book, What is Life and Mind and Matter?, where he speculated that individual consciousness is only a manifestation of a unitary consciousness pervading the universe. According to the memoir of James Watson, DNA, The Secret of Life, and the autobiographical book, What Mad Pursuit, by Francis Crick, it was this book by Schrodinger that inspired them to study the gene. The result of their study of genes, as you perhaps know, was a Nobel Prize for the discovery of the double helix structure of the DNA. The truth is, prior to my Korean hillside experience, I don't remember all the sources that I had read that connected physics and Eastern philosophy. Nor do I remember all the sources that I had read that suggested the existence of a universal consciousness in which we all participate. For the popular press had become aware of the connection, then there were many such sources to which I was exposed. But regardless of the sources, I certainly was aware of these ideas of the physicists, and I was vaguely aware of the outlines of Eastern philosophy. Some six months after my Korean hillside experience digesting these ideas while reflecting upon my vision, I think it must have been my guardian angel who gave me another gift, appendicitis. During the train trip from Missouri to the Army base in Wisconsin, where the Army Reserve had sent me for summer camp, my belly began to hurt. Next morning I went on sick call as soon as I was permitted to do so around 7 a.m. After waiting an hour or two, I saw the company medic. He told me he had no instruments, not even a thermometer. So he sent me to the battalion sick bay to see if they could figure out if I was sick. After another couple of hours of waiting, some medic stuck a thermometer into my mouth and duly informed me that I was ill. A brilliant diagnosis, I thought, given the intense pain in my belly. He sent me to a clinic up another level in the chain of command, from where, after waiting the requisite couple of hours, they sent me to the base medical center. After the obligatory military wait of another couple of hours, I finally met a real MD, a major, who ordered a blood test. Pretty soon, I heard him screaming, Are you sure? Do it again! Then he's screaming on the phone, I don't care if the base commander's is the only one available, get it there now! <laughs> I was so dizzy on the trip to the hospital that I worried I'd lose consciousness and fall out. Army jeeps had no doors. But I safely arrived at a Catholic hospital, I think in Green Bay, Wisconsin. As we entered the long U-shaped driveway, I was dismayed to see a huge flight of stairs ahead of me going up to the entry. Once parked, the driver jumped out with the papers from the army doctor and helped me start up the stairs. About the time I took the first step onto the sidewalk, out of the door flew a girl who was so beautiful I almost forgot all about being sick. She had her hands in the air and she came tripping down the steps very fast. Down two steps, then hopping over a third, a couple of more steps, another hop. Moments before when the jeep had stopped, I had glanced at my watch. Almost exactly 5 p.m. I thought, oh, I get it. She just left work and is rushing down to the arms of her boyfriend. My curiosity got the best of me. How handsome does a guy have to be to get a girl like that? And what kind of fancy sports car might he be driving anyway? So I turned around to take a look back at the circular driveway and saw only the Jeep. I turned to look again at the girl just as she suddenly changed her trajectory and ran straight at me and grabbed me. She told the soldier, I'll help him. You take the papers on up to fill out the forms. They're waiting for you. As soon as we got inside, the girl steered me to a little room near the door, thrust the paper bag in my hand and said, Take off all your clothes and put them in the sack while I take your medical history. Hmm, well... After I got myself up onto the gurney, the doctor came in and asked how I was. I said I had been hurting, but now the hurt was gone. 
I was shocked at how soft and feeble my voice was. The doctor patted my shoulder and rushed out, and I heard him shouting on the phone. Forget that your patient is already scrubbed down. Empty the operating room immediately. You can do that operation anytime. This is a life and death case, and it's a young boy, and he's fading fast. Shortly after that, I heard ladies talking. Someone said, is he going to make it? A nurse answered, doctor says he has a 50-50 chance. I thought, oh, that's too bad. Must have been an automobile accident or something. Then it dawned on me that they were talking about, oof, this is bad. At that point, I remember the many sermons I'd heard in the Baptist church in which it was claimed that there were no atheists on deathbeds. So, I introspected to see if I was still an atheist. I quickly reviewed some of the contradictions I'd found in the Bible, contradictions that I'll discuss in a later segment, some of the contrary scientific evidence, some of my own experiences that seemed to contradict the Bible, and concluded that I still could see no reason to soften my atheism. It was a question of integrity. Would I abandon the truth as I saw it on the outside chance there was a ticked off God somewhere that was going to make me burn forever in hell? No way. I was smiling as he rolled me down to the operating room, for I felt that I had discovered yet one more bit of misinformation told to me by the fundamentalists. There certainly are atheists on deathbeds. As soon as the gurney stopped rolling, nurses began scrubbing me down, and the anesthesiologist slapped the mask over my nose and told me to count backwards, starting from ten. Well, I had had general anesthesia when I was four years old, and I knew what she thought was going to happen. But I was going to fool her by using my indomitable willpower. After all, I had gone out for Army Airborne and easily passed the rigorous test. All those push-ups and all. Right. So I'd show her what Army Tough was all about. I was going to count all the way down to zero, so there. When I got down to seven, I heard a sound in the room. I opened my eyes and saw the same gorgeous girl who had come running down the stairs. Now that I had time to really look at her, I decided that she was even more beautiful than I remembered. Tall and as slender as I was, but I didn't have to look twice to know that she was a girl and no makeup. This was 1960, and maybe in San Francisco there were already girls who rejected all that was fake and false. Hippies rejected above all else the deceitful aspects of society, but in the Midwest? I was impressed. I also saw that I no longer was in the operating room. Instead, I was connected to all sorts of tubes and wires in a large hospital room with a long counter that had two sinks and various glasses and containers around them. It was the clinking of the glass that had awakened me as she was puttering around the counter. I also became aware of resting in a pile of poop. I thought, oh no, what a heck of a time to be alone with a beautiful girl. Soon she noticed me watching and said, Oh, you're awake. I said hi and asked her name. I'll call her Shailene. Then I asked her how long I'd been in the hospital. She picked up the chart and count of the days. I was surprised, for based on what she said, summer camp was about over. We talked for a few moments, and then she said, I spent almost every night with you since you arrived. The way she said it seemed unnecessarily personal. Then abruptly, she left. Next, someone came in and temporarily disconnected all the tubes and wires. After that, Chaley and two very silly girls who were wearing plenty of makeup came in and changed my soiled bedclothes. After that, Chaley returned with a large pan of water and a washcloth. She instructed me to call her through the closed door as soon as I had washed where she couldn't and had covered myself with a washcloth. Then she'd return and wash the rest of my body. And thus began a routine of long conversations as she washed my body. Perhaps in response to my comment about her lack of makeup, she told me that she had been thinking about becoming a nun. But she said when she talked to the mother superior in a convent, it was suggested that she first volunteer in the hospital to see if she liked serving others. Then she quickly added, I no longer want to be a nun. She looked at me. I didn't respond, nor did I ask why she no longer wanted to be a nun. I knew.